Hello everyone, my name is Ms. Hu and I am a physics teacher. So in this video, I'm going to give an introduction to direct current motors. Now I'm using Jamboard because I'm more of a Jamboard, whiteboard, blackboard, chalkboard kind of teacher rather than a PowerPoint teacher. Because as I scribble or I draw, I feel that it helps you grow your own uh, rational thought processes so that it's easier for you to remember and recall rather than having to memorize everything that you've learned. So, in this video, we will be learning the basic construction of direct current motors as well as compare brushless and brushed motors. Now, in order to understand how direct current motors work, you first of all must understand how forces are induced in a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field. If you haven't already learned that, do check out my video which explains how a force is induced. Watch that video first, get an understanding, and then come back to this video. So these images are taken from the uh, KSSM textbook, so thank you to Commentary and Community Malaysia for the images. Okay, let's take a look at the diagram on the top left. So I want you to visualize that what's going on here is we've got a piece of wire, and we fashion it into a rectangular coil just like this. So the labels here of ABCD is just to show you how the rectangular coil has been created from a single wire. We now take this single wire, maybe I'll just make this image a little bit larger. This wire is now taken uh, and placed within uh, the field of permanent magnets and this wire has to be connected of course to a direct and uh, so this rectangular coil is then placed within the magnetic field between two permanent magnets and we will connect this coil to a direct current circuit. So remember the direct current means current that flows in a single direction only. So we will be connecting this coil to a direct current circuit where we have a power source with a fixed positive and negative terminal. So imagine if this side was positive and this is connected to the negative terminal. So this coil is exactly the same as this coil over here. So that's why we've got current flowing in this direction and then flowing out the other direction. Now based on what we already understand about how induced forces can be created, we have current flowing in the wire here and it's cutting across the magnetic field and this will induce a force. Based on Fleming's left hand rule, we'll find that AB, which is on the left hand side, will generate a force upwards. Now, do take note that because this is part of the same circuit, the current that's flowing on the left side of the coil, AB, is opposite to the direction of the current flowing on the right side of the coil, CD. Take a look at it closely. All of this is part of the same circuit, and that is why the current flowing on the left side and the right side are obviously in opposite directions. Because the current is flowing in opposite directions, in the same magnetic field, this will create a pair of forces that are acting in the opposite direction. That's why on CD, it's downwards, while AB is upwards. Now, because the forces are acting in opposite directions. So imagine if you have an object. Let me take my calculator for this. So if you have an object where one side the force is being applied upwards and the other side the force is being applied downwards, what's going to happen to the object? What do you think? That's right. It's going to rotate. So if we secure this coil to an axle, which allows our rotation. So an axle basically, think of it as like a rod, and then we connect it in such a way that allows for a pivot point. This axle will allow the coil to rotate, and that's what will happen. So if you enable this coil to continuously rotate, this is how you can create a motor. So a motor basically is a device that spins or rotates. So that's how the direct current motor can be created. What we see at the bottom here are the copper port fields. So the diagram on the left shows us the original magnetic fields. So the blue color lines show us the magnetic fields that exist between the permanent magnets, and the green color circles show us the magnetic fields that exist around the cross section of those wires. So we call that X symbol represents current flowing inwards. 
and the dot represents current flowing outlets. So the interaction between the magnetic fields of the blue colored arrows and the green colored arrows will produce a catapult field that looks just like this, which is the diagram on the right side. So this is how it creates a pair of forces acting in the opposite directions. And these opposing forces acting on the same coil will create a rotation. Now imagine you want to generate continuous rotation. So let's look at this diagram. Now do you imagine, hmm, if we connect this to a circuit like this. So I'm just drawing the symbols over here. Now look at it and think, is it possible for this coil to continuously rotate in the same direction? Logically, no, right? Oh, one. If this was to continuously rotate, what's going to happen to the wires here? Exactly, it's going to get all tangled up. Secondly, it is impossible for it to continuously rotate in the same direction because when this AB goes to the other side, so what's going to happen is that the coil is not going to continuously rotate in a single circular direction. Like in this case, you can see, oh, it's going to rotate um, clockwise, right? But, real but in reality, what's going to happen is it's going to do this. And that's not at all efficient. So that's why we have to make some changes to this setup to enable a continuous rotation. And that's how this very simple direct current motor was invented. So in order to enable continuous rotation, we have a commutator ring and a pair of carbon brushes. Now the commutator is quite simply a single ring that has been split into two halves. The colors here are not important. Um, actually, there's no color at all. So the reason why this diagram has it colored red and blue is so that we can take a look at what it looks like when there's a first half and second half rotation, as we will see in the next slide. So the colors are not important. So now, let me show you how the motor would rotate and what the commutator and carbon brushes are for. So this is a video I've taken from the KSSM textbook. And uh, let's, we're not going to play the entire video. We're just going to watch a short snippet. So here we've got the rectangular coil placed between two permanent magnets. This S is uh, slapan or sal, and this U is bitara or not. As you can see, here's a commutator ring, the carbon brush, and it's the circuit. Now observe what happens to the commutator as the coil rotates. You can see that the commutator rotates together with the coil. Why this is important? And you can see that the carbon brush doesn't move. The purpose of the carbon brush is to maintain a connection between the circuit and the coil. But you can also see that as the coil rotates, right, it's moving away from the circuit. So the purpose of the commutator is to enable a continuous flow of current from the circuit into the coils. So this is how it works. So current flows from the dry cell to the wires, into the carbon brush, into the commutator ring, and into the coil, back out to the commutator ring, to the carbon brush, into the circuit. So the carbon brushes and the commutator ring work together to ensure a continuous supply of current from the dry cell into the coil. So the carbon brush doesn't move. As the commutator rings, the carbon brush merely touches the commutator ring as it rotates. Alright, so now that we understand better how the commutator rotates together with the coil, let's see what the function is for the commutator and carbon brush in more detail. So here on this slide, we can see two diagrams. Um, side by side, we have the first half rotation and second half rotation. Again, these visuals were taken from the KSSM textbook, so thank you to Kementri and to Malaysia for these visuals. So on the left hand side, what we have here is the uh, coil ABCD that is connected to the power supply this way, placed between two permanent magnets, north and south. So here we've got the force on the left side pushing downwards and on CV, on the right side, is pushing upwards, so this causes a rotation that is anti-clockwise. The pink colored arrows here show us the current direction. Now you, of course, must understand that when a coil rotates, 
As it doesn't have rotation, the left side AB is going to go to the right side and CD from the right side is going to go to the left side. So then you'll find in the diagram on the right, it may look the same, but actually ABCD have exchanged positions. AB is now on the right side and CD is now on the left side. If you look at it overall, the current direction is still the same because it is a direct current uh, circuit. So current is still flowing from positive, going to X, and overall when you look at it, it is making a clockwise direction. Same thing with the right side. Coming from positive, going to X, going to the clock, it is overall a clockwise direction. However, when we take a closer look at what's happening inside the coil, Let's talk about ABCD. Current is flowing in the first half rotation from A to B to C to D. But in the second half rotation, once they've exchanged places, current is now flowing from D to C to B to A. So the current has exchanged directions when we look at the piece of wire that's been made into the coil itself. But overall, the current is still flowing in the same direction. And that's how it's able to maintain a continuous rotation in the same direction. So one thing that uh, I get asked a lot is, you know, why do we need a commutator that's split into two half rings? Why can't we just use, you know, say, can we just use a, you know, a complete circle as a commutator? It is a good question, and it's something that I encourage you to think about as to why. Let me share with you one of the reasons. So when you place a commutator that's a full circle, you're going to create a short circuit. So when current flows, instead of flowing through the coil, it's going to flow through the path of zero resistance. If you have forgotten what a short is, check out my video on short circuits. So the current is going to completely ignore the coil and flow only through the commutator to the other side back to the negative terminal. As a result, because there's no current flowing into the coil, no current flow means no magnetic fields around the wire, hence there's no interaction and no force, So, which means the motor is not going to spin. Now, even if, even if the current splits, that means it will split into flowing through the commutator as well through the coil, it also reduces the efficiency because it's not having all the current flow through the coil, now you have some current flowing through the commutator and some current flowing through the coil. And as we already know, one of the factors which affect the speed of rotation of the motor is the value of the current. And if the current is reduced, then obviously the speed of rotation will also be reduced. Hence, reducing the efficiency of this motor. And that is why we cannot have a completely circular one ring acting as the commutator. So just again to point out to you, the colors of the commutator is not important. They're not magnetic, they're not north and south. The reason why the visuals are colored this way is to show you how are the exchange place. So it's just to show you red color was initially on the left and blue was on the right and now they've changed place. So red is now on the right and blue is on the left. Also, a question that some students do ask is, what happens when the brake reaches a carbon brush? You know, as it rotates, oh, there's a brake. Wouldn't the motor also stop rotating? So yes, while it's spinning, there may be a brief moment where there's no current flow, hence no force. But because inertia makes it continue to rotate, this would then cause the commutator to come in contact with the carbon brush again and continue its rotation. So now let us discuss the factors which affect the speed of rotation of the DC motor. So you must remember, because the rotation depends on the forces, that means the forces depend on what creates those forces in the first place. So definitely, the next I factor, as is the current. Because we're going to be talking about speed of rotation, speed of rotation, of course, is influenced by the magnitude of the forces that have been induced, which means that the factors which affect the value of the induced force is also a factor of the speed of rotation. So which means that the strength of the magnetic fields of the permanent magnets are definitely a factor as well as the magnitude of the current flow that's inside the coil. 
Well, because we are also creating a call, this means that the number of turns of the coil are also a factor. What I mean by number of turns is how many loops of the coil. So if we look back at this uh, model, you'll find there's only one loop. That means this one. Now if you want to create more loops, all you need to do is just keep looping the wire around and around the same coil before connecting it to the commutator. So the more loops we have, obviously more force will be induced, hence greater speed of rotation. Another factor that you should also be aware of is the presence of the iron core. Now, in the diagram we saw just now, there's no iron core. So without any iron core, it will still work. But it would be far more efficient if we place an iron core in here. How you place an iron core is this. An iron core basically is a piece of iron that's placed in the core or in the center of the core. So I'm going to draw it in the second half rotation diagram because um, I want to make it clear. So if you get an iron cylinder like this and you have the core around it and you have the axle going through the core and through the core, so what happens is as the core rotates, the core will also rotate together. If you don't have a piece of iron in the middle, it will still work, but not so well compared to if you place an iron core. So, placing an iron core does make a lot of difference in terms of the speed of rotation. And these other factors which affect the speed of rotation of the DC motor. So now, we know how a basic DC motor is constructed. But as physics students, you should be aware that we're always looking for a way to improve on what we already know. So this is extremely basic and of course if there's a way to make this more efficient, uh, we should try to explore that. So that's why we need to know the factors because by manipulating the factors, we will be able to manipulate the speed of rotation. But of course if we know a better way to design this motor, it will be even more awesome. And that's how brushless motors came about. So what we've learned so far is the brushed motor. So a brushed motor refers to the presence of the carbon brush. So if we take a closer look at the diagram on the right side, the carbon brush is not obvious, but it's this thing here, this piece over here. Now actually there is a matching um, set on the other side, but it's blocked. So it's at least one pair. The carbon brush is here, and on the other side there's also one. You can also see that there is a commutator here. In fact, uh, the commutator has been split into more than uh, two halves. It's split into many sections. So you can see the split here, right? So we've got a commutator here. Okay, there's a split there and another split there. So these are the commutators. And remember, I mentioned the axle. Yeah, that's the axle that goes. Uh, look, that has a commutator there. The iron core is on the inside of the core. You can't see it because the core is wrapped around the iron core, right? This axle would spin. The magnet remains stationary. The axle will rotate together the commutator and the copper cords. Now, one of the problems of a brushed motor is that. This requires continuous contact between the carbon brush and the commutator. I want you to think about the motor. If the motor spins very, very quickly, the faster it spins, the more friction that's going to be generated between the carbon brush and the commutator. So for one, it will generate a lot of heat, which is wasted energy, as you already know. Secondly, if the motor spins too quickly, it can actually create sparks. Thirdly, it wears out more quickly. Because think about it, if there's friction, and these are physical objects, mind you. So what happens is continuous friction and a lot of heat energy generated will end up wearing out the contact between the carbon brush and the commutator. So which means that you have to continually replace the carbon brush and the commutator. Because of these disadvantages, that's how the brushless motor came about. So the brushless motor does not have carbon brush or commutator. What happens is you have the coil in the middle here. The magnet rotates around the coil to create that force. So there's no carbon brush, no commutator. So that reduces friction, reduces the loss of energy in the form of heat, um, does not create any sparks, and lasts longer. Of course, uh, brushless motors do cost more than brushed motors. So we normally would use brush motors in um, 
objects that do not have very high, you know, like uh, revolutions per minute, have lower, you know, spin rotations. Um, you, need, you need something that's more cost uh, effective, you know, so you don't have to spend so much. Yes, you use the brush motor. However, if uh, you need something that has higher quality, you need it to last longer, and there's very high speed of rotation, then you have to use the brushless motor. So if you'd like to learn more about the difference between the brushless motor and brushed motor, and also find out in more detail how they work. There are some excellent resources which I'm sharing over here, as well as in the description, um, which gives you a far more detailed explanation. These are excellent videos I highly encourage you to watch. They explain it very clearly, and it's very, very easy to understand, and they show you extremely fantastic detail as to what's happening inside the brushless motor and the brushed motor. So I'm encouraging you to watch these videos because I don't have the resources yet to make my own videos. So I'm encouraging you to watch these videos because they're excellent graphics with excellent explanation. So I hope you have found this video useful and helpful in understanding better how DC motors are created and how they work. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to click like and remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Visits Rocks. Happy studying!